you know. So we're talking about um, the equivalent of a middle-aged man who suddenly realised that he's been sitting at his desk his whole life, he's overweight, he's drinking too much, smoking too much, he's he had a heart attack, and the doctor said, you've got to change it, you've got to change the way you're living, you've got to turn this whole thing around. I was contacted this spring by a researcher working for the EU, and he said he wanted to use my YouTube as a platform for getting this concern out there more. So that's what we're doing here, informing you and, and giving you some ideas for how to, how to improve soil in Europe and all around us, world over. And with, I interview Adam, who is the scientist, and so he's giving the scientific viewpoint. And then he says, well, farmers don't listen to scientists like me. They listen to their peers. And so we thought, well, that'd be interesting then to link his comments with what my son Jack is doing. He's in his, coming to the end of his first year, organic farming, he's 28 now. He's always been working on the land and he's passionate about soil. So we'll see how he can translate that desire to improve his soil, which he acknowledges. And most farmers do know this. They know they've got to look after the soil. They haven't been very well informed or well led uh, or well incentivized really, uh, that would make a big difference if it was made economically more easier for farms to farmers to work better on their soil. So let's dive in to me interviewing Adam and find out what he's doing in their EU initiative. Uh, my name is Adam O'Toole, I'm a soil scientist working for Nibio in Norway and um, we're involved in a uh, soil literacy project called Prep Soil. Uh, funded by the EU, and that is uh, part of the soil mission, uh, European soil mission. And we're on our own little mission to raise the level of soil literacy around Europe, you know, people's understanding of what soil is, why it's important, and uh, the current status of, of soil health in Europe and, and what can be done to make it better so that we you know, all have a beautiful green rolling hills like you see behind me, which, you know, do what they're meant to do. Uh, how would you define better soil um, in this context? We, we talk about the the idea of soil health, you know. You can have soils which are unhealthy, you know, they're not, they're not performing, you know, the way that they should. They're not, you know, they're not uh, either producing a high yield. They might be producing more greenhouse gases than they should be. Maybe a lot of the nutrients are being lost away. The opposite of that is then better soils. So soils which are um, maintaining their level of organic matter or ideally uh, increasing the level of organic matter. Soils which are able to retain water so that plants can use them. It doesn't get washed away easily. Or the soil itself actually doesn't get washed away, which is a huge problem. That's what we call erosion. And also that... The, the the idea that soil is a habitat as well. Yeah, so in gardening, I feel that no dig, no till offers a lot of answers. Uh, maybe it's slightly different in farming. I, I definitely think like no till is definitely part of the equation, you know. But it it's one part. As, it's one part of the equation. But you would also, I, I believe, agree that it's not the silver bullet for arresting soil decline. And the classic example for that is here in Australia, where no-till, basically all the cropping areas now are no-till uh, on, you know, large-scale broadacre, which basically means that they're not inverting the soil. They're yep. not inverting the soil. Minimum yep. tillage, yep. absolute minimum, but they do it out of necessity because mm -hmm. um, they've learned through hard experience that by uh, importing European invert tillage, that um, it's just not economical, it costs too much, and it doesn't actually work in these more sort of sensitive environments. Mm. So, um, but despite there being no till, at least since the 1980s, it still hasn't arrested the decline of soil organic matter. So that shows that mm. it's only part of the equation. It will yeah. slow the decline of organic matter, but it won't arrest its decline. And so there's, a, there's so much other things you need to do in order to either maintain current levels of organic matter or take them up to the next level. Yeah, so no-till is one of many factors at play. Um, but you've got something called Soil Deal for Europe? Yes, so um, the European Union in the last number of years has pulled a lot of their research and development funds into tackling some 
major uh, societal uh, problems. And the one we're talking about today is the soil mission. So um, it's been said that 75% of these, the agricultural soils in Europe are actually in an unhealthy state. And there's a goal to, with this soil deal or this soil mission, to reverse that situation such that in the next actual seven years, actually by 2030, that 75% are in a healthy state. Sounds wonderful, but what, how? How is this going to happen? <laughs> well, so, yes, it's not easy. It's only seven years left, right? Yeah. So European Union has actually done something quite uh, bold and ambitious. And um, remember, this is a research and development program. So um, in the past, in uh, the conventional way of, of solving problems is, well, let's get our smartest people, let's get our greatest scientists and you know, give them lots of money and get them finding the solutions to these problems. You know, let's write a check and please, smart scientists, solve the problem for us. Well, the problem is we we have been doing that for a long time <laughs> and the soils aren't getting any better, right? Yeah. So they've taken the ambitious uh, move to say, well, let's try something different. So they want to start 100 what they call living labs uh, around Europe. This is just a starter, but this is sort of a model about how they want to do it. And they want to bring the farmer into the fore, into the foreground as a central actor in this uh, research and innovation process about how to turn around. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones sitting behind the tractor, right? Yeah. They're the ones with the fork in the ground. And your idea is that the, these living labs could be like seeds almost, and then the knowledge and ideas will spread out from them? Yeah, that, that's what we hope. And a lot of farmers already um, have a sort of somewhat of a natural scepticism towards scientists like myself. And um, it's well proven, actually, through social research that, that farmers uh, are more likely to, to listen to their peers and to look to their peers for knowledge and innovation so why not why not work with that fact if if that is the case then let them work together let them learn from one another the scientists can be involved and use their data analytical skills use their scientific method skills to help them in the process but not necessarily be the ones that um sitting and thinking oh what shall we research on now you know um so it has to be this sort of collaboration such that the problems that get solved are the ones that the farmers need solved, not necessarily the one that the scientist wants to investigate because it sounds like a good research paper. Yeah, because we, we've had this discussion amongst ourselves a bit, uh, like, and with my son, Jack, who's farming, and we're going to see him later in the video, and, and you know he gets a bit aggrieved because farmers are so much put in the light as the, the bad actor who is trashing the environment and, and they're just following leads from government subsidies and pricing in order to make a living, which quite a few of them aren't even doing that. So that that's where, yeah, if this study can really help address those issues, I think it would be amazing. Um, yes. Well, what I'd ask, uh, I'd encourage people to do is um, one sort of, we're always thinking, what can the average person do? And the, the, the soil mission has come up with a soil mission manifesto which is basically just like a um something you can sign to say that you support the idea of of healthy soils in europe put your name behind it doesn't have any more obligation than that and um just so that there's some sort of recognition that there's you know it we're building a movement of people great well thank you very much for that and we'll look forward to hearing more about this incredible project and um, i wish you lots of success with it and um, yeah, yeah keep going <laughs> right thanks charles yes so a lot going on that we don't hear about much do have a look at the website link we give where you can sign that soil petition it will make a difference every little bit makes a difference and likewise now we're gonna see what jack is doing it's not a lovely time of year to be looking at a farm it's uh, wet late autumn the soil actually looks pretty sad uh, especially where he's working with machinery it's not like homemakers where we're working all by hand uh, i'm standing right next to an organic no-till cover crop which actually is must have been killed by frost in an established garden where i'm bringing in compost and that's very different to his farm where he can't use that amount of organic matter he's using as much as he can and you'll see that it, it doesn't look as pretty as here uh, forgive 
the land for that, but you'll get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, no, it, well, it's quite laughable, really, how um, people would think like, that the farmers would be doing damage because it's within their interest to get it right because it's got to pay for itself in an industry that's incredibly shrewd. Um, so yeah, you're just shooting yourself in the foot if, um, if, you, if you're doing bad practice. When you see stuff about, oh, there's only X amount of harvest left. Very uncomparable to UK agriculture. It's probably one of the most sustainable in the world. Most people running very good systems and very efficiently. There'd, there'd be always a few bad eggs, but... Um, so you wouldn't say your top soil is dying? Nah, 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 we've got plenty of time now. Well, you've seen that out and about, like, some places our top soil is only that deep, but it's incredibly healthy and you look after it, right? It'll look after you. Yeah, it's, it's a very wet November, um, so we haven't planted everything we want to. Running an organic system, mixed cropping, arable and grassland, which both rely on each other to make the system up. Because um, you, you have different like grades of soil. Yeah, one, two and three, one being the best. Uh, we're on grade three here, <laughs> which is not ideal. But then the way uh, we run the rotation and the crop and plan is always trying to improve that soil, keep the best in it, because you can soon fall foul uh, if you're not looking after it. So say like with the plough, if you're ploughing too deep, you're just going to bring up clay, which isn't going to grow anything. So you've got to, whatever method you're using, you've got to do it right. We've got three different soil types within the grade three seed. So you've got brashy grain with a lot of stone in it, very easy working, higher wearing on machinery. Then we've got some loamier clay, it's easy to work down, and then really heavy clay, um, which is a pig to work anything, especially in a year like this. So. Yeah, this was wheat, um, and we actually just direct drilled this uh, straight in. It looked, it looked favorable conditions. So yeah, it worked very well, to be honest. What, what is direct drilling and why, why are people starting to do it? Direct drilling is, is when you are, you've no cultivation before drilling, you just go in with the drill. Um, Soil like this, you'll have very mixed results on. Again, in an organic system, it's more favorable to the plough because you are always trying to add something back into the soil. Um, and we'll be ploughing very shallow anyway. Um, like maximum four inches, ideally. Direct drilling, if, if you've got all the trash on top, you, you basically gonna block the drill up. Um, there's better technologies coming through. Um, but something with this land, you, you want a good seed soil contact and direct drilling, you, you can't always get it, mainly because you need perfect conditions on this ground to get it right, to be honest. End of the day round here on grade free soil, you might have the window to direct drill 20% of your farm or 20% of the crops you're putting in um, and the weather's likely to change and then you've got to revert back to older methods. So suddenly one of the big problems with the direct drilling is a lot of these drills are a lot of money, sort of ranging from 70 to over 100 grand for a new one. Um, so if you go and invest in that and then you can't use it and you've got to revert back to your plough and your, your combi drill, then it, it's a lot of money tied up on that system. Um, I say one of the most fascinating differences is say we're, we're, we're limited to how much muck we're allowed to apply every year. And then so what we're putting on say per square metre compared to what you put on in your garden uh, we probably put 10 times as less on, um, where you're not allowed to spread anymore. Because um, of leaching into rivers and things? Yeah, which is, it's quite frustrating because it's, it's a very one size fits all policy, if you know what I mean. Um, the way we do things here is very different to what they'll be doing on flinty plains in, in Wiltshire, say. Um, which isn't a problem. Um, you got to work around it, but yeah, it's a very interesting difference. Yeah, it's coming up nicely. So that's wheat. 
Yeah, winter wheat, melon wheat. Maybe try and dodge the uh, gateway bit. The head then got drilled later, basically. This uh, this is for um, growing for wild farmed, uh, who run a lot of. Uh, they're very pro regen ag, and there's uh, there's a set of rules you got to go by to grow the crop, um, and one of them's by cropping. Um, what does that mean? So you basically, if if you're growing a wheat for them, you've got to have either a white clover or a bean, basically legumes, a companion crop with the wheat, which is a good system. And I'm very I'm very intrigued as to how it's going to work because. All the research on a bicropped wheat crop is the disease resilience is much better. Um, and again, so last year that was the big problem we had. Um, disease. Yeah, 